Alrighty, good morning. good morning. We're here. I know you're probably freaked out because the countdown was not on the screen. Was that scary for anybody? Freaked me out. It freaked you out. We were, yeah. we were kind of we, we had a little technical difficulty. Yeah, the people on tech were all freaked out. Actually, we're uh, we're still starting on time, but yeah. uh, we can start whenever we want, I guess, and they wouldn't know a time. No, we're just starting. So happy day after Fourth of July, oh, no. Dana. Happy. Day after Fourth of July, everybody to just all of watching you. out there. Yeah. So, did you have a fun Fourth? What'd you do? We did. We stayed home. We had just a couple people yeah. over to our house, hung nice. out in our backyard, had a little bonfire pit thing. We strung up some lights. Our neighbors went crazy with the fireworks. I mean, not like spectacular yes. shows, just like every neighbor had the really loud ones that went off. It was. I wonder if everybody experienced that because yeah. we went. I went to go buy some fireworks. I mean, I'm not very smart, I guess, because it was like. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, just thinking, oh, okay, I'll pick up a couple fireworks. Yeah. I went to the Safeway uh, there in Duval, and um, they were sold out except for the cheapest thing they had was like $150. And I'm not Did quite a $150 yeah. no, <laughs> firework person. No. I'm more like a $20 firework right. person. I'm okay? more like sparkers. And uh, I, was, I was asking, like, this is all you have? She's like, yeah. She said, I've worked here every year, and we are so sold out this year. Everything. Weird. She said, we've never had, like, sold so much stuff. Yeah. So I think because because shows and fireworks shows were canceled. Right. Yeah. So everybody's at home. We were at home, did a little fire pit and roasted some hot dogs and stuff yeah. over that. Had a couple yeah. friends over and neighbors. Yeah. So, we did little sparklers yeah. for the kids. And, and it was so it, yeah. loud in the neighborhood. It was wasn't really it? loud. Fireworks were just going yes. boom. Like, yes. From like it was really loud. My kids on. just kind of kept jumping. Like They weren't afraid, but it was like really startling to everybody. They were very loud. The hardest yeah. thing is falling asleep on yeah. 4th of July. My neighborhood kind of like went quiet Did around 11, quiet? 11.30. Like mm. they just kind of stopped. A few went off here and there after that. But yeah. Eugene burned his finger on a sparkler. I know. Oh. I was like holding it with him. And as soon as like he was watching and as soon as the fire went out on it, he just grabbed it. Like, so it was like no <laughs> fire grab. And then, it, you know, fire takes a second to like get hot. So he's like looking, looking. And then so there was that little episode. But. Otherwise, we had a really fun Otherwise, time. Otherwise, good, yeah. yeah. Sparklers are always fun I for know. everybody. I know, And usually safe. Usually yeah, safe. Except maybe not with two-year-olds. That was maybe uh, an oversight on my part, but whatever. He wasn't doing Live rocket launchers or anything no, like we, that. No, we steered clear with those, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good, good. Fun. Okay, well, yeah. let's do some birthdays. Yeah, we'll start let's. off with that. And we have one important one that we missed last we week. We did, and we're Actually, sorry. So Maverick we Hills, out. happy birthday to you. Happy a birthday. A week ago. We're we sorry we missed it, we but we hope 15, it was wonderful. Right? I think a, I think he turned 15. We're not sure, but happy birthday. Give or take last a couple week. years, yeah. And a few kids. You want to do these? A few kids, yes. Luke and Noah Heckman, happy birthday to you guys. Yay. Faith Nelson, happy birthday, happy birthday to you, girl. Um, Brady Mundy, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Evangeline Tholen, is that how you say that last name? I think so, Tholen. I think yeah. so. Anyway, happy birthday to you. I miss you. Happy birthday. Always the hardest part of our day. Is pronunciation the names. I know we got names. some good ones today. We have some fun <laughs> ones. All right. And then moving on up from our kids, the older kid, Becca Kissinger. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Sabrina Jackson. Happy birthday. I'll let you do one. Tara Orman, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Okay, yes. here's our difficult one for the day. Emma Ganashamorthy. Ganashamorthy. Uh let uh, me know if I've got that right. If you're watching. Yes. Uh Send us spell uh, that in a way that we'll know. Send us a phonetical <laughs> spelling, okay? Mm -hmm. Now that we have Cairns right, we want to get everybody's <laughs> name pronounced right. We will never forget that one. And last, oh no, we got two more. Yeah, Kirsten Edwards. Happy and birthday! And that was today. That's happy today. birthday today. Yes, and Ann Staub. Happy birthday Ann Staub, to happy you. Birthday also, today. I think today. Also, yes. And Brady Monday was today too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's very fun. Fun day. Did yeah. anybody see who was the fourth? Uh, Faith Nelson was on the fourth, so that yeah. was seen. So all of America celebrated you, Faith. That's, that's very exciting. Very wonderful. For kids, yes. some, what's exciting coming up for kids for in kids, August? For kids, oh my goodness, we have Bible Camp coming up August 3rd through 6th. It is online, and it's yes. going to be super awesome. You guys don't want to miss it. Um, they have lots. I heard there's a time machine that's going to show up in it, mm -hmm. and I know lots of crazy cool things. So you guys kind of cool not if you could travel back in time, huh? Or forward, maybe. Ooh, or forward. Get out. Yeah, can you? <laughs> what, if you had to choose one, what would you choose? Back or forward? I don't know. Right? Maybe maybe forward. I'm a planner, so if Ooh, I could go forward, know then what I could, happened? Like, yeah, come back <clears throat> and plan for it. 
Yeah. But could you change it if you saw it? That's the now we're getting question. too deep, <laughs> okay. too deep, too early. We can't go <laughs> there. <laughs> we better move on from there. So sign up. You can sign up online August third through the sixth. Mm-hmm. You don't want to miss it for your kids. It'll nope. be a fun time. Yep. We also have coming up today communion. Today's communion yes, Sunday, the first right. Sunday of the month, mm-hmm. and so we just encourage you if you haven't uh, already yeah. get your elements ready so you can yes. be prepared. We'll do that at the end of the message portion today, mm-hmm. and that'll be good. And then uh, right after this. We're doing something. Yeah. Church in the lot. Church in the lot. So I'm excited. So this is actually first ever mm-hmm. uh, service with people. We right. You have, to, you have to word it right. Yeah. <laughs> Without people. We've done been doing yes. services here, but ser- first services with people. With people. Uh, at 1115, we're doing that out right here in the yeah. lot, and uh, that'll be a lot of fun. You could also join us next week if you'd like yes. to. We'll be doing that again. And uh, yeah. the weather looks like it's going to be perfect. I know, it's Trent. It's sunny today, and we didn't mention it. It's a nice, oh, look at you. With it is shoes. very sunny, <laughs> yes. So I did not have to wear my waterproof <laughs> shoes, although a few days this week I did because we, uh, one more story. We celebrated okay. our anniversary this oh, week. Oh, happy anniversary. Okay? And, uh, right, so our anniversary is July 2nd, and we were having a fire in the fireplace Hanging That's out because it was so cold, right? And yeah. I'm thinking we got married in Sacramento, which is like it was like 120 degrees oh, when we got yeah. married. So it's like kind of a brain trip that it's so cold in July. <laughs> we would have a fire in the fireplace, but not today. I'm wearing flip flops. Today he has his fancy flip flops. Celebrating. Good for you, Trent. You, you got some fancy. I got uh, my, well. These are my red, white, and blue. I'm, oh, I'm festive. So, you're but festive. you did the white today, so that I was did the good. white. Red, I did that. Yeah. Could have done red. And I got my and, red um, shoes. Yeah. I don't know if I can do that. You got red flip flops. That'd be really good. I do. I've. I could. We should have coordinated. Okay. We're not Next week together. we'll coordinate our okay. flip flops. What color styles we're in. Anyway, we could go on. <laughs> we should stop. No, uh, we should stop. W- we're glad you're here. Uh, we're gonna worship in just a minute, and we got a little video here. You can just mm-hmm. watch. It'll kind of just set the tone of worshiping our great and almighty God. Thanks again for being here today. With one voice, we come together from all over the globe, really, right, for Sunday mornings. And uh, we are so glad you're a part with us. And uh, we want to sing and sing out to our mighty God to give him praise. God is the famous one. He is worthy of all our praise. And I just encourage you within your home, I know it may be strange sometimes, but to sing, to worship our God and King. Let's sing this together. Here we go.
Thank you we can celebrate with families. We can come together. God, I thank you for being able to worship online. What a privilege that is. I thank you for later today to get a chance to worship and be together in person. And uh, God, we love you. We praise you. We know that you are in control and you're the only one who is worthy of our praise, Jesus. Help us be more aware of your greatness and glory working all around us, Jesus. We love you so much. We praise you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for singing where you are there at home and worshiping God in your house. Uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, we start a brand new series again today. And uh, I know you're going to enjoy this. And uh, so without further ado, here it is coming at you. man. I'm looking forward to this uh, kind of final floor for the month of July. We've got a ton of business to do today. So uh, right now I'm going to ask that you just would pray with me. That'd be fantastic. And then we're going to get right underway. So let's go ahead and do it together. Jesus, I thank you for the grace that you have shown us, not just as individuals, not just as a church, but as a society. I thank you even for the fact that we are remembering that and celebrating that this weekend, that uh, you have done a thing in this little corner of the world that has changed the world in many ways for the better. And I pray that we never lose sight of that and that we always give you the credit that you are due in all things and how you use imperfect and fallible people to carry out many different missions to advance your gospel and to advance your kingdom in this world. And so we thank you for that, Jesus, and we praise you for that in your good and perfect name. Amen. All right, so uh, it is the final four, and by way of a free election and a democratic process, you all have decided on the topics that I get to deal with for the month of July, and among those was Jesus and the Revolutionary War. Thanks for that one, all right? So this is going to be an interesting Sunday today, all right? And so I want to start it off right from the get-go, trying to just kind of anchor a couple of ideas, and then we're going to jump right into some text. We're going to jump into some history, jump back into some text, all right? So let me start this off making some clear declarations. First of all, first declaration, I love being an American, and I love the United States of America. If you drive by my house, you will see an American flag day and night. At night, it's lit in the day. The sunshine when it's sun is sunny here lights that flag so always been flying the flag love the flag more importantly to me though however is i love jesus and i love his book all right and we all as christians know that jesus and his book trumps all things in life he is the supreme lord and master of our lives and his word is the supreme master over all things in our lives as well now i say that because here is a truth that frankly I, i've said many times and i say again uh, there are things that the bible says that I don't like. There are things that the Bible calls us to do that frankly I disagree with, but when I disagree, it wins and I lose, right? And so we're gonna understand that in some of this conversation today. Now, another thing I wanna say is I'm Scottish, right? And uh, we Scottish people have had our own issues with the English as much as the colonies had issues with the English, and so have to navigate that humanness in there as well and try to figure some things out. But our mission today is to try to understand how the Bible intersects with this topic, all right? Now, in doing that, it doesn't take away from the fact that, you know what, what has been created in our society is unlike anything the world had ever seen up to that point. And the very freedoms and ideals and advocacy that was built into this equation known as the United States is powerful. And part of what's powerful about it is the fact that what the founders kind of designed in there was this reality that says, you know what, keep learning, keep growing, keep discovering how we can advance greater and further freedoms as we move along. In fact, if you just think about the trajectory of our history, it's pretty incredible to think that like in 1789 was the first election, but it was only 6% of the population. You were male, you were white, you were a landowner, you paid your taxes, and you could vote. 
But then like 80 years later, all white Americans, whether they were landowners or not, could vote. And then a little while after that, like in the 1870s, the African-American slaves were freed and they could vote. And of course, there was the Jim Crow laws and things of that nature. But we continued to course correct and solve those problems. And then in the 1920s, you ladies, you were able to vote. And just a little while after that, the Native American peoples were able to vote. And then in my birth year, 1971, all of you 18 to 21 year olds, you could vote. See, I highlight that just simply to say one of the most incredible things about our system is that we went from 10 amendments to 27 amendments because there's this constant hunger for greater, further freedom for us to continue to refine and adapt so that everybody, all peoples at all times in all sorts of ways have the liberty that we are celebrating this weekend. I think that's a powerful thing because this is an ideal that literally has changed the world. And so I can say with confidence that God has blessed America, and from that, America has blessed the world, right? No debate. But the question we are asking today, the question that you have asked me to tackle is, well, how does then the New Testament relate to the war for independence and the things that led up to that? And how would we navigate that if we were living in the colonies during that time and we had our Bibles and trying to figure out how we address those things? And, and that's kind of the task today. And as we do that, I want to remind us of this simple idea that throughout our own Christian history, uh, God has done tremendous things and blessed movements even though at times throughout those movements, the individuals involved or the times or the seasons, uh, man, those were imperfect types of people, right? I mean, you just read through your Bible and you go, Abraham, imperfect guy, Moses, imperfect guy, David, the same, the 12 apostles, the same, the history of the church, the same. And what we might have to face a little bit today is the fact that some of the things that led into this, not what was born out of it, but led into it, maybe the Bible said some things that we have to again, wrestle through a little bit. Now, uh, as I go into reading a passage out of the book of Romans to you, I want to be clear with one last thing, which is uh, I, I'm not talking about all war or all wars or anything like that. Um, so if anybody says, well, what about Bonhoeffer and the Nazis? I'm like, different discussion, different passages. We could talk about that at a different time. But we're, we're really trying to look at where uh, the revolution intersects with God's revelation, right? And so with that, I read a passage from Paul out of Romans chapter 13 to start things off. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So I want to stop there for a second and note that Paul here is writing to Christians in Rome under the Roman Empire, very heavy tax system. Uh, there was laws, but they only favored a certain portion of people. It was a very difficult time. Eventually, you had people like Nero, just crazy people, as the emperor. And yet, Paul is saying, we bring a different thing to the table as followers of Jesus. In fact, when you look at the whole ministry and message of Jesus, it's this counter-earthly, counter-cultural, counter-revolutionary system of loving the unlovely, of caring for our enemies, of changing the world by doing things differently than the world does them. And so Paul is writing in that same vein, right? Like everybody else wants to resist, but he's like, no, we, we're going to win this battle in the name of Jesus in a different way. From this, he continues. He says, the rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but rather to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval for God. He is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong to your governing authorities, he's saying, right? He doesn't bear the sword in vain for he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection. Again, Paul is being very clear that these are commands, right? To us. We must be uh, in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, which is a very strong statement, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you must also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. This is the passage that we will come back to at the end and try to measure kind of some of this history against, right? 
But now I have to give you a hopefully rapid history lesson to catch us up to speed and then kind of roll back into Romans chapter 13. So it's the 16th century and mercantilism is grabbing hold in Europe, right? And so this is a massive trade system. And when you have a lot of trade, you need a lot of supplies to undergird the trade. And so wisely, Queen Elizabeth said, you know what? We need to expand our territory because she knew that Spain was just going all over the place and they were starting to gobble up a lot of resources. And so in her wisdom and foresight, she had this thought of saying, we need to colonize with a British colonial system the North American content that con, uh, context there that's recently been discovered, right? The continent of North America. And so she decides, hey, we need to get this established over there. And so from that, the British colonies in North America are formed. And one of the things we sort of assume sometimes is that the colonies were just this kind of singular mindset group. But really, there was three divisions within the colonies. There was the North colonies or the New England colonies that were more like fishermen and hunters and trappers and things of that nature. You had the middle colonies, which were a bit more farmers, eventually like the Quakers and more of the pacifist types. They kind of settled into that region. And then you had the southern uh, colonies, and those were uh, lots of farmers, lots of plantations, lots of like tobacco and things of that nature. And it was the southern colonies that leveraged a lot more of the slave trade and the use of African slaves in the southern colonies. In fact, when you read material between the north and south colonies, they didn't always appreciate each other or like each other or see the world in the same way. Um, but that was sort of the division. And you could see roughly 80 to 100 years later, that was going to materialize with different problems, right? I say all of that simply to make the point that all of the colonies were British colonies established by England for the purpose of trade, right? So they had a local government, but they were under a British kind of system, jurisdiction, ultimately, right? And that's an important thing to kind of realize here, because in essence, what we want to recall in our history is that we were the property of the British Empire, right? We were an extension of those things. And while in some ways we go, well, that's kind of a bummer. Well, the positive is it also gave the colonies protection from the British military, the Redcoats, right? And this was important because we eventually found ourselves on the precipice of a war in the colonies, which was the French and Indian War. So this began in roughly uh, 1754, went to 1763, and it was a very costly war. In fact, it eventually kind of encompassed much of the world. It kind of became the Seven Years' War, fought on many different fronts. But uniquely, it was fought here in uh, North America, and the British defended the colonies during that time. Now, it was at a great cost, both economically and by way of blood of soldiers, including colonial soldiers. George Washington fought under the British uh, in that uh, particular battle and uh, was a little put out that he didn't get a royal commission by the end, which I'm sure then England later was like, we should have just given that guy a commission. Maybe this whole thing would have turned out different. Good thing for us. He wasn't given a commission and always kind of saw it as a problem uh, there in the colonies. And so that war was fought till 1763. But again, very expensive, very costly for Great Britain. And so from that, the British decided we need to recoup the cost of this war. And so for the first time ever, they were going to tax the colonies. And this tax on the colonies, if you remember your history, was the Stamp Act, right? And this was the way they were going to get out of the debts of the war by taxing the colonies, right? Now, the colonies, they loved the fact that the British had helped them in the war, but they did not like the fact that suddenly they were going to have to pay for the cost of that war through this tax, because like I said, Great Britain had never actually uh, taxed the colonies at this point. Now, if you lived back in England, you were heavily taxed, but this was the first one to kind of hit the colonies. And from this, the colonies were put out. In fact, the phrase, no taxation without equal representation, was born out of the Stamp Act because really the way they looked at this was, wait, we're not even in Parliament to make the decision to forge this tax in the colonies. We're against it. We oppose it. There's no way we're going to do this, right? And so that's kind of what began to transpire. Now, the interesting thing about this particular tax is that it was never collected in the colonies. 
because the colonies in essence kind of revolted so much so that uh, there was never the opportunity to collect the tax. In fact, Benjamin Franklin, our man, Benjamin Franklin, uh, ended up to convince parliament to remove the tax to kind of reduce the amount of anger that was going on in the colonies. And so uh, from that, they rescinded the tax and the colonies went, hey, we just figured out if we protest and we show our independence, we have some leverage over the crown. And so that sort of got registered in their mind. Well, that was in 1765. In 1766, uh, the crown decided to roll back around with a new idea to try to get some taxes, which was the Townsend Acts. And this is where they began to tax goods coming into the colonies. And then they set up in essence like custom officers or customs officers to ensure that the tax was being collected on the goods coming in to the colonies. Well, you can imagine how this went for the colonies. They said, we're not going to do that. They actually harassed the customs officers. They boycotted the British goods and they just started to create a trade system there in the Americas on their own. Right. And so from this, there was a problem. And so the British decided to deploy troops into Boston as kind of a show of force, like a police force to say, you know what? You can't just keep deciding you're going to do what you want to do because you're a, you're still a British colony. That was kind of the mindset behind this. Um, and so the British saw this as sort of a, a subtle act of defiance, if you will, against the ruling body that controlled the colonies. Well, tensions stayed sort of tense up until about 1770. And this is the next critical event that occurred, if you remember your history, which is the Boston Massacre. Now, it's interesting because we think massacre and we think dozens or hundreds of people. Uh, by the end of the massacre, five people were killed. Three on the day of the massacre, two died from their wounds. But the whole thing started when an apprentice wig maker and a British soldier got in an argument. And uh, from that argument, it escalated. About 200 colonists came and surrounded eight British soldiers. And the colonists began to do everything from throw rocks and sticks and snowballs to oyster shells, apparently. Like, that's a really dangerous thing to throw, right? So they started throwing these things at the soldiers. Somebody yelled fire. British soldiers opened fire on the crowd, and hence you have the Boston Massacre. Now, what's interesting about that and why it's so pivotal in the story is that uh, John Adams actually was the attorney that defended the British soldiers. And after the course of a fair trial that was considered a fair trial, most of the soldiers were found not guilty of the incident. Uh, but it didn't matter because the Sons of Liberty also were able to capitalize on that and say the British troops are dangerous and British occupation threatens the American colonies. And so from that, certainly there was this divide that grew, right? The British British are, are dangerous. They're not here for our best interests, but they're here simply to control us. And there's proof uh, kind of in the pie right there. And they saw it. And so the massacre kind of cemented more of these feelings. Well, in 1773, the British pulled out of Boston and they rescinded many of the Townsend Acts, right? And they just kind of stepped back again, trying to let things kind of settle in. But they decided to leverage a new tax. Man, the king, he loves to leverage the taxes. And this time it was a tax on tea, right? And it was a tax that favored British tea at the cost of colonial tea. And part of the problem is that the British tea, much of that kind of establishment was owned by people in the British parliament, right? So it was like these internal guys getting this extra dividend or in, has this extra opportunity for their tea versus kind of the colonial tea. And so we know from that, again, the Sons of Liberty, they stepped in and they boarded British ships and they threw all the tea into the harbor. And so, you know, the Boston Tea Party. Now, what I think is funny about that particular event as they destroyed all of this tea, but they didn't hurt any of the ships and even the lock they broke, the next day they came back and replaced it. Like we took out all that tea, but oh, I'm gonna give you your lock back, you know? So very interesting turn of events there. And it just sent another message to England that our independence is being driven and focused on and we are going to be a different people than what maybe the crown wants us to be. Well, this act of defiance definitely angered England at this point. And so from that, they brought forth uh, the coercive acts or the intolerable acts, as they're called. And this really was a doubling down for England, right? So this is stuff that even comes into our Bill of Rights. This was where they could just do search and seizure at will. 
This is where they could force uh, colonies and colonial homes to actually house British soldiers and feed them and provide for them. Uh, Just again, this took a whole different turn of real control that began to settle in. And so there was a sweeping control where suddenly it was the British military more in charge of the colonies than the colonies themselves. And so there was this real deep doubling down and the animosity, it ramped up very, very quickly all the way into 1775, where the British military decides we need to deal with these revolutionaries. In particular, the leaders, guys like John Adams and his beer, uh, and John Hancock. So the British military marches down to Lexington, Lexington and Concord to arrest these individuals. And it is there that 77 colonial uh, militia, they attack British troops. And they do it very different, right? Like the British are all lined up in their rows and they're used to the certain form of military advancement, but the militia, they were hiding behind trees and rocks. They're like, we've learned from the Indians how to fight differently than you guys. And so in the end, only seven militia were killed, but 73 British soldiers died, 174 were wounded and 26 were missing in action. That was the event known as the shot heard around the world. And it was really in light of that, that man, war was on, right? At first, New England was totally in on it. They're like, yep, we're ready to go, right? But the southern colonies, they're like, man, we trade a lot with England still. There's still a lot of benefits to being a part of English society and rule. But there was two key things that happened that switched it for the southern colonies. The first was the fact that the British Navy began to shell coastal cities just without any mercy, almost without even rhythm, just simply just making the point of you're going to revolt, we're going to burn you to the ground, right? So it became very violent very quickly on a widespread scale. And that was one thing that started to sway the southern colonies. The second thing was Great Britain offered freedom to all African slaves if they fought in the British cause and the southern colonies said, whoa, we can't have that. And so they join into the fight as well. And then you had full-blown colonial war against the British. So between July and August of 1776, uh, we came up with the Declaration of Independence, which I would encourage you all to go after the service and go read online because it is an incredible read and you want to know it. The war was fought until 1782. And then in September of 1783 was the Treaty of Paris where uh, there was a treaty signed The United States was going to be free from Great Britain, and we were allowed to forge our own country, which then over the next five years, we developed the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which was finally introduced in 1788. The Constitution limits the power of government, and the Bill of Rights grants power to the people. There is your history lesson in hopefully 15 or so minutes. All right. Why the history lesson, all right? Uh, Well, again, I want to dovetail this within the passage we read earlier in Romans. And what I first want to kind of highlight is the fact that what we're talking about is not like the United States versus Japan or England versus Germany. We are looking at a history where fundamentally it was uh, a British location underneath British rule. It was people that were a part of a common culture under a common set of rules or laws, which is why, for example, George Washington, if we would have lost, wouldn't have been treated as an enemy combatant. He would have been treated as a traitor guilty of treason because it was seen as kind of an in-house fight, if you will, right? So these people under British control uh, resisted British control and decided they were going to fight for their independence, right? That's how it went down. But we want to keep that in mind because, again, this is a singular entity kind of having a fight internally. Now, I'm not going to say all the reasons were bad or wrong. That's not my thing. But to say that is kind of what we were dealing with. And so the, the, the mainland of Great Britain, right, the island of Great Britain, the English, we're looking at this group of people inside their own culture and saying they're not abiding by this. They're not keeping with this. They're resistant af- after tax, after tax, after tax. And then finally, it turns even more violent in the process of things and becomes a full-blown war. Now, we could talk about fairness of taxes, and we could talk about laws, and we could talk about when protest becomes violent protest, and if that's right or wrong, and all these different things that we could debate in this. But again, I'm not a policymaker, and I'm not a politician. I'm a pastor with a very particular question that's been tasked to me, which is those events that led up to the war, not the things that came out of the war, not the Constitution, not the Bill of Rights, not the birth of our country that came out of that, all of which 
I'm 100% behind, totally supported. I don't see any problem biblically with any of those things. The question, though, is was this revolutionary war, uh, the things that led into it, biblically justifiable? Now, what I think interesting, to me at least about this, um, is that this was an issue that plagued pastors in the colonies. Um, they had to wrestle with this pretty heavily. And so there was a book called Sacred Scripture, Sacred War by James Byrd. And he does something really interesting. He collects all of these sermons, uh, pretty much preached between 1674 and 1800, collects about 17,148 different biblical citations through all of those sermons, and he did this to say, what did preachers preach on? What was their take? What were they telling their congregations uh, to believe? And what were they saying the Bible instructed in relationship to these things? Like, what was the big idea that was in there? And it was interesting because what he found is that the chief most referenced passage, there was a handful, but in that little smattering was the one I opened with at the beginning. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. So they taught on this heavily. They taught on this often. The other one they taught on was the words of Jesus when he said, uh, you know what? You heard it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But now I tell you to turn the other cheek. Between Romans 13 and Matthew 5, those were among the most dominating passages taught in pulpits in the colonial times uh, leading into the war, through the war, and after the war, Right? And the question becomes, well, what did they teach in relationship to those? And here's a quote in relationship to kind of deconstructing what was being taught. It says this, you can't overcome or you can't convince Americans who revere the Bible to take up arms against the authority unless you can persuade them that these passages are not addressing their situation. Right? So in essence, what the conclusion was, was that many colonial pastors, right, of which is my heritage, uh, specifically looked at these passages, taught these passages and said, these don't apply to us, right? We are exempt from these passages and they would have sort of reasons why we were exempt. And so they would take an obvious thing like, oh, submission to your government and paying your taxes and explain why this passage didn't count for us in this time because our circumstances were different. Now, here's what I understand about that. It's very understandable. We are all human and we all see the world in a certain way. And there is always a temptation to want to say, that one doesn't apply for me, right? That's why I said at the beginning, there are things in here I don't like, but it wins, I lose when I know that seems pretty clear. And Romans 13 seems pretty clear. Now, I don't want you to miss what I'm saying here. As things escalated into full-blown war and there was the shelling of the Navy, you could certainly begin to make arguments that, hey, now this is self-defense and that's a completely different discussion, right? But the things that led up to that, that escalated to that, uh, were certainly things revolving around submission to government and taxes that created the hostility and the aggression and eventually uh, everything that kind of came forth from these types of things, and pastors in the colonies definitely played the role of saying, we need to kind of mobilize and prepare the people for this kind of revolution against England. And so it's interesting when you go back and you look at their sermons, they taught heavily from Moses because he was taking people out of bondage and into freedom. And he was also a guy that definitely set up things as far as like, okay, we're going to break you into thousands and hundreds and fifties. And they saw him as more of a Republican with laws, but they didn't like to preach from like Kings and Chronicles and Samuel because those dudes like David was a King and they didn't like the monarchy. So they wouldn't preach from David unless it was preaching about warfare, like David and Goliath and mobilizing uh, people to want to resist and revolt, right? That was sort of what the pastors would contribute to in these times, right? To excuse away the tension. Now, in the end, uh, it's what I said at the beginning, God uses all things to bring forth his blessing in the world. God uses imperfect people to produce, in the end, really beautiful and blessed things. And so uh, I don't want you to walk away from this and say, Matt doesn't see the beauty of our freedoms. I totally do. Or Matt doesn't see the value of what came out of the Revolutionary War. I absolutely do, right? But again, in kind of being tasked with the question, were the series of steps going into that something that we could go, well, there's clearly why it's okay to do this in the Bible. The Bible creates a real tension. And I think for us today, as I want to kind of round this out, I want to remind us of what makes Christianity so different in the world. 
What makes it different is when it does things differently than the world does it, right? That's what makes us unique. Like, like part of faith is having the faith to trust Jesus's words about loving your neighbor, about loving your enemy, about not seeking first this world, but seeking the kingdom and its righteousness. And these things are added to you. The tension of faith is the fact that faith looks foolish to the world. It looks weak to the world. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians, right? But Jesus uses the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, to confound those who think they're wise and think they're strong, right? Now, do I believe that somehow we still would have become a culture, a society, a beautiful civilization like we are today without the war? I think God sovereignly might have done that, right? He might have found different ways to do that. In the end, hey, that we are what we are is fantastic. Support it 100%. I think it's the greatest thing, greatest thing ever, right? But we do want to be honest and open-eyed to the fact that we all sometimes want to excuse this away for our own purposes or ends. It's always been the history of uh, Christianity. It's been the history of the Bible. And we shouldn't be surprised when we find it even at times in our own history. And so with that, I just want to close with one last passage out of Peter. So Peter's a little bit down the road from Paul, realistically, timeline-wise. And um, at this point, the Roman Empire has really ramped up its efforts against Christianity. And you would think at this point, it would be like, Peter would be like, hey, man, I drew a sword back in that garden that one night, and I should have kept that thing out. Time to bust swords and make this happen. We're going to deal with Rome. We're going to override it with force. But that's not actually what Peter says. Instead, he tells Christians who are suffering at the hands directly of Rome, he says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free. Go, yes, freedom. He says, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. I mean, that's mind-blowing at that point. But then he says why in verse 21. He says, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued to entrust himself to the one who judges justly. See, I think the biggest challenge always for us as Christians is to be able to have the faith to trust Jesus's way. And I'll be honest with you, there are times I don't. There are times I don't. I go, it's too impractical. It's too impossible. Um, I'll put myself at risk too much. Um, I'll just take things into my own hands. That is true. And there's been times I've done that and God has still blessed me despite me. That is true too. But our mission is not to figure out where can I take control of things and hopefully be blessed on the other side, but rather where can I obey and seek the blessing on the inside as well as whatever blessing might be on the other side as well. And so that is always to be our heart. That is always to be what we keep before us. Because again, before we are anything else, we are followers of Jesus and followers of his book. Let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus, I thank you for your hard words. And I thank you that your hard words are not meant to be just this thing that we go, oh, that's scripture. That's the word of God. It sits over there as a holy thing under glass that we admire in, in idea only. No, your word has utility. Your word calls us to hard actions. Your word calls us to faith. When we want to use our force, we want to use our control. We want to make demands. And you go, well, wait, but I've called you to servanthood. I've called you to something different. I've called you to change the world by leaning into things that everybody says is weak and foolish. I pray that we will have great faith in your revealed truth. We will do the hard things, not just the easy things. That more than making any demands, we will choose to be the servants of all. That we will use our freedom for those purposes. I think about even this morning as we prepare for communion, we're sitting here taking bread and cup and reflecting on the fact that you're like, hey, if my kingdom was of this world, my people would fight, but your kingdom's not of this world, so we're different people. We love, we care, we invest, we sacrifice. 
We do the hard things to bring real eternal change. So may we never lose sight of that, right? May we always appreciate what you've given us as a culture. May we appreciate the United States of America, love all that it has grown and developed into, and use that to then be greater servants for you, making much of you and pointing to the beauty of your very counterintuitive word that blesses and frees. Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, and we need you in your good and perfect name. Amen. Well, like I said, this morning is communion, and I think it's very appropriate. I think it's appropriate based on the topic, um, I, I think for the very fact that it kind of centers us, for us as followers of Jesus, on what is truly our identity, right? Our identity more than anything else is Jesus in this world. It doesn't matter if it's Jesus in this world in the United States or in Canada, or in Mexico, or in China, or Syria, or Chile, or anywhere else. It's our identity is no matter where we are planted, we are planted to look like Jesus, to look like the cross, right? To look like the servants who care, who are not bound by the frustrations, the fears, and the cares of this world, but rather we are bound by a higher calling that is ultimately eternal. And so when we think about Jesus giving his body and giving his blood, he calls us to the same task. That's what we saw in Peter. He left us an example that we are to follow. And so this morning, as we prepare for communion, I challenge all of us to let that be our center point. That what we are identifying with as we take the bread and take the cup is we're identifying with a suffering savior who gave himself in self-sacrifice for the good of those who didn't want it, who suffered at the hands of those who want to control this world And he says, well, you can't control me. I'm going to give myself for this world. And I'm going to free it in a way completely antithetical to everything you hold dear. That is what we remember today in communion. And so I think about that night where Jesus took some bread. He thanked God, broke it, passed it out to all of his followers, including all the way down to you and I today. And he said, this is my body that is given for you Do this in remembrance of me. So the meal concludes. It's the end of the night. Jesus knows what's coming. He will lay himself down in his freedom. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, sealed between myself and you so that you can have a relationship with my father and you can live like me. And so with that, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, I thank you again that you've invested into us. We are such weak, incomplete, fallible people. We choose our own way and do our own things so often. And in your grace, you still love us and forgive us and use us. The human condition is replete with a history of learning, growing, failure, overreaching in all sorts of ways. And yet your kingdom still moves forward. I think about how you use your church in all of its brokenness to still bring blessing to the world. May we always be aware, aware of our own propensity for our own independence so that we might submit to you and be truly dependent. And from that, we will be truly free. So Jesus, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you in your perfect name. Amen. Just encourage you to reflect on his greatness for a moment. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forever. Praise His name forever.
the Lord's blessing over you and your family. So the Lord bless you and keep you. Oh, make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. grant you peace in your home. Thank you so much for being with us today. I pray you have a fantastic week. Enjoy the holiday weekend, and uh, we will see you back here next for part two of this series. Stay tuned to find out what the topic is going to be, and uh, you are sent out there now to go and be God's light to the world around you, your family, everything. Have a fantastic day. Take care, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.